meeting here with Simon Mainwaring. He is an author and a blogger and a speaker, and he became famous with his book called We First, which is about how brands can use social and technology to become sustainable and profitable brands. Hi everyone, I'm uh, here with Simon Mainwaring in, L in LA. Yep. Did I pronounce it right? Yeah. Mannering, Mannering. Mannering. Both will do, yeah. What's your prep? What's your Mannering. 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 Okay. Yeah. Simon Mannering. Yep. He's originally from Australia. Yes. Living in LA. He's a very successful author. He's running a very successful consultancy firm. Uh, his book was launched in 2011, yep. I think. It's called We First. Um, and I would like to talk with, uh, with Simon yeah. about that for a, for a short interview. So maybe it's a good thing to start with sharing your philosophy about how brands should behave or what brands should do. Absolutely. Thanks for the chance to share some thinking. And, you know, just as background, I'd spent 18 years as an ad guy in Australia and London and then in the US. And it was interesting. As an Australian, you always feel like you're missing out on something. You always want to go to the other side of the world <clears throat> because there's something going on that you've missed out on. Um, but having done a lot of these things and worked on Nike as a, as a writer at Wyden and Kennedy in Portland, and I, I was worldwide creative director on Motorola and had a big job, there was a part of me, something was still missing. Okay. I don't know what it was. It just, I was unhappy. I was in my late thirties. I had two young children. And in the end, I ended up writing this book, We First, to answer a speech that Bill Gates gave at the World Economic Forum. It was called his Creative Capitalism Speech, where he said, mm -hmm. the private sector needs to play a bigger role in social change. And the only reason I wrote the book was because I think something was missing. I, I felt like I was selling things just for the sake of selling them. Right. Whether it was Nike shoes or Toyota cars or Motorola phones, it was a great creative exercise, but I felt that something was missing. And then the global economic meltdown happened, mm -hmm. where you saw Wall Street and Main Street and our hopes and healthcare and homes come under jeopardy, and then it went on to Greece and Iceland and the Gulf states. And I realized there was something wrong with the way that business was operating. There was just something, the motives behind it was so self-serving that it was not only hurting us, it was hurting the entire system. Mm -hmm. And so <clears throat> the book We First was a reaction to that. You know, it's a counterpoint to the idea of Me First. And so the book really is a reflection of this philosophy that ultimately the best way that we can serve ourselves, in a good sense, is to serve the collective, to serve everybody. And so it's not just about shifting from me to we, but it's really to we first, prioritizing the collective first. Because, I mean, the reality is this. This is not about being Pollyanna or pie in the sky. This is about sitting there and going, if we only serve ourselves, at some point, customers aren't going to trust you or feel well served mm -hmm. by you as a brand. And if we only serve ourselves as companies and take all the profit and damage the environment and ignore the consequences, eventually that cost is going to visit upon all of society and there won't be a middle class to even support companies and brands. And so, you know, 2007, 2008 was a moment when the self-serving mindset, this me first mind mindset was so strong that the whole system seemed to come unstuck and it had a huge knock on effect all around the world. It's been very interesting since then because, you know, the book came out in June of 2011. At first people would go, that's a nice idea, never going to happen. Business doing good, business thinking of the interests of everyone, business taking responsibility for cultural issues and society and, and humanity and the planet at large, never going to happen. Mm -hmm. And over the last six to seven years, I think, especially in North America and to a different degree in EMEA and, and Europe and then Asia, you see a big change. And I think that's happened because we're more aware of the challenges we face, like climate change. We're more connected than ever by social technologies and younger demographics, millennials and Gen Z, that were just coming through at that time mm -hmm. are now much more in control. And so to answer your question, We First is really a philosophy where we look at the role of business and compare it to government and philanthropy and say, we're better equipped than anybody to make the positive difference that we need to make. And in so doing, employees, customers, consumers will like our brands and help drive our growth. And more and more we're, we're seeing that play out. And I think, especially in North America now, 
everywhere on your social feeds in the newspapers every day you're seeing brands talking about the difference they're making in the world mm -hmm. and that wasn't the case five years ago so it's been very encouraging to see the shift and I, I like the philosophy if I can challenge you a little of bit on it. Uh, I'm always wondering are brands using it for PR mm -hmm. or are they serious about it I see a lot of companies that say they're doing the greatest things but if you dive deep you see that that's just an outer shell, yeah. but it's not their core belief. Is that something that you feel as well? Absolutely. I think it's very, very true. I mean, I think whether we were looking at philanthropy in the 80s or corporate social responsibility in the 90s yeah. or sustainability in the 2000s, mm -hmm. purpose, which is quite a thing right now amongst um, companies and branding, there's always differing degrees. There are those who wait for everybody else to do it before they do anything. Mm -hmm. There are those who say they are doing it but aren't really changing internally. And then there are those who are doing it authentically. The thing that I'm so encouraged by is that consumers today, especially the younger demographics who have grown up with smartphones and know nothing else, mm -hmm. they don't trust advertising. Mm -hmm. They smell BS a million miles away. Mm -hmm. I've got an 18 and a 16 year old daughter. They come from to the world is I don't trust you as a brand until you prove yeah. that it's legitimate. So they start with, let's they say, start with distrust. their dads. So if you look at Edelman's Trust Barometer Report, which is the largest sort of trust study, consumer study of its kind around the world, or if you look at their um, Earn Brand Index, there's two big shifts. This come from, which is from a place of distrust, so it's like prove yourself first. Mm -hmm. And then secondly, more and more brands are being rewarded for taking a stance on a cultural issue, even though it will alienate some people, yeah. it will deepen the loyalty of others. Yeah. And they actually get penalized for not having a point of view. So all of that is to say that okay. I love the idea that consumers are cynical. I love the idea that brands who do it disingenuously get called out. And I think it will only continue. And that's the greatest self-regulator in this business because we marketers can talk a good game all day long, mm -hmm. but the consumer just knows when it's not true. And if you look at anybody's Facebook feed these days, it's full of brands being called out. CEOs being called out yeah. for saying one and doing it. This is the new normal. So I think we're in a place where you better do it authentically or, or you're going to get called on it. Okay. Yeah. And, and what do you think about the, the truthfulness of some consumers? Mm -hmm. um, We've seen brands that really did bad things. Huh? That's typical example is Volkswagen with their whole sure. fraud that they did. Mm -hmm. Year after that, Volkswagen sells more cars than ever before. Mm -hmm. um, you hear people complain about child labor in, in Asia, mm -hmm. and then they buy the cheapest clothes in the world, right. even though they know sure. that it's it's you know not a fair process on the other side. But yeah. still, there they think like it's my wallet and it's yeah. my money. Yeah. How do you look at that in that world? Because I, I, I meet some brands that say, yeah, we, we want to do the right thing, but yeah. we're afraid that consumers are not really yeah. responsive enough towards that. Yeah, I think it's a little naive to think that if brands do good, consumers will automatically support them 100%. I think there's a couple of things going on. I think self-interest is part of human nature. Mm -hmm. But I also think at the same time, a lot of the issues that business can affect are starting to have a very real impact on people's lives. So for example, here in California, in LA, climate change and the change in the weather patterns has led to an amazing series of massive fires yeah. and things that have really affected air quality in the way we live. Right. In a lot of countries south of, you know, in the southern hemisphere, Pakistan and others, climate change is caused water scarcity in, in Sao Paulo and cities mm -hmm. around the world and so on. So part of the world is still exempt from feeling the effects, but more and more of the world feeling are feeling it. it on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. And only then do I think that consumers will wake up because brands have to wake up because they're held accountable, accounted, accountable publicly. Consumers will still look after themselves to a large degree until yeah. it's not in their interest to do so. For example, I'm an Australian. And I, and I grew up in the water, I'm a surfer, and I cared about the oceans because that's who I am. But when I heard about the destruction of the Great Barrier Reef in Australia, mm -hmm. which is such a part of our national identity, yeah, of course. it's a whole other level of concern. 
And I think it's going to get more and more personal for people. And then I think consumers will quickly realize that they have a very important role to play in new thinking and new behavior. Yeah. So basically brands are pre-investing mm -hmm. to be ready to have that trusted image and waiting until the mass consumer gets open to that? Or is yeah, that I don't think it's kind of linear like that. I don't think the brands are getting ahead of it and the consumers will come. I think there's different consumers that are kind of have been driving this movement in okay. partnership with certain brands. And I think there's growing awareness um, of a lot of the issues and some of it is carrot and stick. Some of it's like, we're gonna incentivize you to do well. Look at the good we can do together. And that's why some people do it. Other people do it because it's the stick, it's punitive. If we don't do it, we're in trouble. Yeah. And sometimes they don't wanna do it at all, but there's a mandated law, like you can't water your garden every day of the week. You right. can't wash your car with a garden hose. Yeah. You know, you have to recycle on these days of the week and you get fined if you don't recycle. So some of it's imposed. But I do think whether it's through the lens of the Paris Climate Agreement or the Sustainable Development Goals or the World Economic Forum Global Risks, business is on the hook, mm -hmm. irrespective of what consumers are doing. Publicly now, they're being scrutinized on a daily basis and increasingly their ability to do well over the long term in the stock market and in the public forum, their social license to operate is being affected by how responsible they are. Yeah. Can we play a game? Can I shout sure. out some names of companies and you give your feedback to see how far they are in implementing your philosophy? Sure. Can we try that? Yeah, okay. Nike. I think they're a long way down the track. Uh, they have been for a long time. A, because they've done a lot of things right since their inception, which is they've always been in the business of movement making. Mm -hmm. And B, because they took a lot of criticism early on, quite rightly, for things like child labor and, and their supply chain and so on, but they have actually invested in making that difference. Mm -hmm. So, you know, one way or another, they got there. Yeah, and I think what they do really well is, is they have an opinion, and even if some people don't like it, yeah. They go for it. I thought it was wonderful this yeah. week when people were burning Nike shoes and yes. everything that yeah. they had this disclaimer that they made yeah. how to burn our products in a, a safe way. Absolutely. That was amazing they, in terms of, of. Yeah, and they said that burning time. our product is very American. Yeah. They said, but at the same time, they said, you might want to consider donating our product to veterans yeah. who need it more. So look at this dialogue that's going on. Yeah. You, and very there's a lot of people who said, an athlete and sport has no business talking about cultural political issues. Mm -hmm. But that, those days are over. Yeah. As soon as social media came along and an individual, let alone a pop star or an elite athlete, had channels that could reach people without a television print or radio station, it's over. So I think those who are saying there's no sport has no business in the cultural arena mm -hmm. are just out of touch. Amazon. I think Amazon in its inception was a very, very interesting idea and there was a lot of promise built into the very name itself. I think they, and again, this is my anecdotal opinion, it's mm -hmm. not based on research or insight internally. They've taken a lot of public criticism about their labor practices. Yes. There is a fairly aggressive, um, monopolistic tone um, to their brand right now, which I don't know if it's kind of imposed on them or cultivated by them. They are an enormous threat to a lot of retailers mm -hmm. all around the world. And I think right now there's a huge missed opportunity for them to play a very meaningful role in the world. I think they had it inherently in their name. I think as they're going back out into retail and creating stores, I think as they're broadening their supply chain and the products they take to market, they are this incredible social web which has been rewoven that even if just to some small degree they would make an investment in the communities they would reach, they could be transformative around the world. Do you think they're not doing that because they're too successful at this moment? So that it's not a priority? Yeah, I think sometimes that's the case, that success blinds you to the need to either give back or do better, and maybe there's a race to be the next trillion dollar company or the most richest man in the world. Um, I, I actually think part of it, and again, anecdotal, no basis for this, is that they've always been such a data-driven company, mm -hmm. such an engineering mindset, that I think they're a little head-led, and I've lost, I think the, the brand has lost some of its heart. And maybe that's why it shows up in labor practices, and yeah. that's why it shows up in the culture. Um, 
and their utility that is data driven with an engineering mindset, which has led them to be enormously successful, but that shouldn't rob them of their humanity. Is that, that, it, it, that conclusion, you think that's something typical for a lot of the successful technology companies? I, I, I don't think I would generalize that much, but what I would say is, and I'll use concrete examples, but if we're looking at Google and Facebook right now, yes. which took a, in more recent years, took a very algorithmic, mm -hmm. data-driven um, approach to engagement with fleshware, human beings, mm -hmm. which was optimized to extract the most money possible through the lens of advertisers, they've both been extraordinarily successful. Mm -hmm. But whether it's an invasion of privacy or the misuse of people's data or just simple ill will with consumers now, the both brands are taking a hit, mm -hmm. a regulatory hit and a perception hit. Now they're both enormous and there are both ruling the world along with the Amazons and others of the world and Apple. Um, but it's certainly a less positive environment than it was two or three years ago. I mm -hmm. mean, when you think about the goodwill towards Facebook and its growth, and now you look at what, in North America, apparently there's 5% less users than there were a year ago, whatever the figure is, that's significant. Something has changed. And unless they get that balance right, which is a balance that it genuinely fosters trust from people, if you don't have people using the platform, there's nothing to talk about. It's over. Um, but I do think they have such monopolies right now that mm -hmm. it's quite a challenge to see them come unstuck. Yeah. But on the other hand, this could be a large or a big opportunity for, let's say, more of the traditional companies that mm -hmm. could grow in digital, yeah. but at the same time add that human and part. That human has aspect. Add that, you know, doing well for, for society, not just for shareholders to yep. it, to make a difference. And I mean, you know, this all sounds like theory, but just as a, as a human being, as a consumer, as a citizen, if you sit there and go, am I going to buy this product or this product? By one company or another company, and they're pretty similar products. It's hard to disagree with the fact that if you know that this company is doing good and their product is what you want and it's a fair price, mm -hmm. you're more likely to buy that product. You're more likely to be in their consideration set. Because when you sit down to your computer to buy something, the first question is, who am I going to look up? If I don't like a company, I'm not going to look them up in the first place. Mm -hmm. If I don't feel good about Facebook and I feel like they're going to misuse my data, I'm not going to open mm -hmm. Facebook. You know, um, so I, I feel like you can only manipulate people too far for so long before they step back and go, you know what? There's lots of different things I can do with my attention and my time, yeah. and I don't have to put it there anymore. What is your favorite example of of companies implementing your We First philosophy? There are so many companies for or a number of the sure they, they they just they do similar things for different reasons at different points in time. But I thought Airbnb has done a wonderful job to bring a brand to life in new ways around their proposition, which is universal belonging, you know, to create a world in which everyone can feel like they belong. You know, whether that was providing apartments for bomb victims after the Paris attacks, or whether it was Syrian refugees giving them accommodation, so many different ways that a brand can show up that is meaningful, that builds a halo effect for the brand. Mm -hmm. I also think, think it was very smart that they realized that what the brand owned was not the idea of renting out accommodation or apartments or, or you know, houses, but they own the idea of belonging. So now they can offer you know, city tours, music tours, restaurant guides, as well as accommodation, because they're all different ways to belong anywhere in the world. So I thought mm -hmm. there was a fundamental universal human proposition that fed directly into products and services that were relevant. And then by bringing that to life, they brought a lot of, earned a lot of goodwill for the brand. I think um, Lyft has done a very interesting job of positioning themselves as the alternative, the other, to Uber, which mm -hmm. to some degree epitomized the Silicon Valley, you know, um, market domination philosophy, get a lot of venture capital or private equity funding, go like hell, crush the competition. As I understand it, there's a little bit of a boys club, a little bit as you know, and, and you know, there's been a lot of public exposure to that effect. And so with that in mind, um, I think Lyft has done a wonderful job of 
elevating its own brand and its almost feminine energy to make feel, people feel better about the brand and want to be a part of it. Maybe a last question. Um, if we talk about making the right choices, um, ethically correct, and we look at the possibilities of artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. I think this is going to be a huge topic in the next decade. Yep. Uh, figuring out a way to make sure that as a consumer and a society, mm -hmm. that you know that the algorithms that companies are using mm -hmm. are fair. Right. How, how do you look at that, ethics and, and AI? Well, ethics and AI is a huge debate. I mean, one extreme, you've got you know, Zuckerberg and Musk arguing one way or another as to whether it's the end of humanity as we know it and it should be feared or whether it's a positive. Right. Here's the fundamental shift as I understand it. There was a moment in time around the advent of Facebook after which no human being was the same as any human being that came before. Why? Because up till that point, our experience of the real world was defined by our choices in the real world. But after that point, we started to volunteer data about ourselves, mm -hmm. our friends, our families, our newborn. We'd put our ultrasound from the, the, the birth up on Facebook. And that data set now informs everything we see through the web. So as we increasingly look, live our lives through the lens of a small screen, whether it's our smartphone or computer, it's being shaped by data that's been shared by us or somebody else. Mm -hmm. So our initial, our literal experience of life is being shaped by data that precedes us or comes as an aggregate from other people. So I don't think we even have a, an authentic, a pure experience of life anymore. So that's just context for what I think. So we're already to some degree being shaped. Our experience of life is being shaped by data in a way that never existed before. Mm -hmm. Taking that to the whole next level with um, AI, I do think that ultimately there's, a, there's an instinct, there's a gut reaction within human beings where if something doesn't feel right to them or doesn't seem to be sufficiently in the interest of the collective or what allows us to sustain, sustain, sustain society and function as communities, there will be an inherent pushback. Maybe not initially, maybe self-interest will win the day, but if algorithms get so powerful and so manipulative and so dominant in our lives that we become accessories to them, mm -hmm. that we're just nothing but fleshware to generate data points, to be manipulated and sold to somebody else, to mm -hmm. make money for advertisers, something will show up in us which will be an opt-out. And the, we've seen some early indications of that. Gen Alpha, which is, you know, after Gen Z, there's a lot of them that are now priding themselves on having nothing to do with technology. Increasingly, we have seen Gen Z walk away from a platform like Facebook because it's not right for them. They're all over Instagram and to some degree Snap still, but they've walked away from at one time was the only and dominant platform. So to presume that we're beholden to these algorithms and that we can't break away, I think is a little bit naive. I think we can move away when we feel it's either not relevant to us or dangerous to us. Mm -hmm. And at, at its most extreme, we may see a point where people are saying, you know what, we're going to be the um, always off generation. You guys were the always on generation. You live from one screen to another. Just as a function of being young and being different to you, mum and dad, we're going to be the always off generation. It's totally possible. So I think AI can allow us to accelerate innovation and learnings that will benefit humanity in so many different ways at scale in a way that we've never seen before. At the same time, I trust in the human instinct that if something is so manipulative of us and so self-serving that there's something that shows up us individually and collectively that allows us to leverage our power as a group to move away from it and therefore cause changes. So I'm cautiously optimistic, I'd say. Okay, fantastic. Well, yeah. Thanks a lot for your insights. I hope it's helpful and thank you, thank you for including me. And um, here's to uh, you know, a world in which our, the connective tissue between human beings, augmented by technology, um, actually improves the quality and experience of life for everyone. And that we, and we don't just end up being the products and we actually end up kind of being happier, healthy, more vibrant human beings. That's what I hope anyway. No, that's fantastic. Okay. Thanks a lot, man. Yeah, thanks.